organizing this event. It's my, it's one of my favorite. I get to do the, the holiday ones, the mother's day. And then this holiday one. And I think that, um, it's a great event because we can spend a few minutes talking about fertility and answer any of the fertility questions, but also just talk about how this is a particularly hard time of year in general. And I think especially for anybody who is in the middle of a fertility journey or about to start a fertility journey or having a hard time in any way. So, and we have the incredible Tanya Woods here to talk about the emotional piece. So um, my job, I'm going to introduce you really quickly to Kind Body. Um, I'm going to do a little sort of intro to fertility, and then we'll get into the, the fun part, or not the fun part, but the good part of this talk. So um, as, as Sydney mentioned, we're all part of Kind Body. Kind Body is a network of fertility clinics. We have clinics all across the country. Um, and in all of our clinics, we provide a full spectrum of fertility care. Um, and we were really, I think one of the things that makes us special is we, as fertility clinics, as an organization, we were really founded on a mission to try to make care more accessible. Okay. In every way, like affordable, your employer pays for it, accessible, and that it's not intimidating, that it's like, feels like a safe place to come get this really sort of sensitive, vulnerable care um, and a space where everybody feels welcomed. And that is sort of kind of the, the mission upon which we were founded. And I, and I guess the last part of this, and Tanya is a piece of that, I think that in that, in the execution of that mission, we have also tried to be kind of holistic in our approach to care. So not just talking about providing fertility services, which I'm gonna mention on the next page, but all the other parts of it, you know, the mental health aspect, you know, um, the nutrition aspect, uh, sort of the wellness aspect, the, the acupuncture, the mindfulness, all those things. So we do try to integrate that into the care um, as an organization. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, again, what do we do? We do everything, the whole spectrum of fertility care we do here. And that includes everything from, you know, preconception counseling, which is, hey, I'm, I'm about to start trying. I haven't started trying yet. What do I need to know for optimization? We do fertility preservation, which is saying, hey, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready to start a family yet. I have no idea when I'm going to be ready to start a family. And I want to do something um, to increase my odds of being able to have the family I want in the future. We help individuals, we do fertility care, fertility care, people, individuals or couples who are trying to conceive and having a hard time. We do fertility care for communities of people who need donated eggs. They need donated eggs, but they need family building support with donated gametes, eggs, sperm, so our LGBTQ community. Um, and then we do this, all the other sort of holistic approach, which I just mentioned, which sort of includes nutrition. Uh, a huge piece of it is nutrition and both mental health. So that's kind of who we are and what we do. And we'll take the next slide. All right. And as again, I, I really just think we're sort of on, on a mission. So in addition to being, I mean, Tanya and I participate in providing care. We're the people who touch the patients, support the patients, but there's a whole other team of people at Kind Body who are out there trying to convince your employers to offer this as a benefit to you. That's their job is to go out to employers and say, if you don't provide a fertility benefit, you're not going to have a good, you're, you need to do this for your employees. So that's the other part of what we do. We think that for everybody should have access, everybody should have access to fertility care. So there's a whole other team of people who do that. And as we mentioned, it's really the focus of today is talking around, for, talking about fertility around the holidays. And um, I think that this time of year is one of two times of year that they're is particularly triggering. Um, we're going to talk about why that is, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies to manage it. Um, I want to be really clear here. I'm going to read these three bullets in a second, but I, I want to first acknowledge that if you, you are in the middle of a fertility journey, you will say, the, you, you know that this is hard all the time. This is the thing I've realized when I do like a, a, a Mother's Day event or a fertility event is that this is always hard. You know, going through a fertility journey, 
every day can be hard. Every week can be hard. Every month can be hard, right? And so it recognizing that and then just saying, hey, there's these extra times where it's even harder. And so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So what are some of these triggers? Why, why do we identify this time or think about this time as a particularly hard time? I'm just going to read them here. Number one, you're struggling with infertility and you find it difficult to be around family, right? The holidays are a time of year where we're surrounded by family, friends, people we haven't seen for a long time, potentially. A lot of catching up and what are the bullet points of your life, right? That's what's often happening at these events. Um, bringing in old family dynamic, right? That maybe is constructive and maybe not, right? So though if that's something you've been avoiding, you can't do that anymore. Number two, you're not ready to have kids. You're actually not in the middle of a fertility journey, but you're now with people who are asking those questions and you're not ready to talk about it. You're not wanting to talk about it. Okay. Number three, like I just mentioned, you're in the midst of a fertility treatment and that feels really private. It is really private. It can be very private. There's a lot of a lot of feeling around that um, that you may not want to share with Uncle George, you know, who you haven't seen for three years, right? And so I think that these are kind of really three clear reasons why we, I, we think this time is particularly hard. And Tanya is going to walk us through all of them in, in just a minute. So before we get started, I won't take up too much time because I would say this is the probably the boring part of the talk today is, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about fertility, a very quick overview about the way that I think about fertility and fertility care and how we sort of investigate and support patients who are building family. It always comes down to these basic building blocks of pregnancy in order at the most basic level, in order to create a pregnancy, we need sperm, we need eggs. We need a uterus, okay? That uterus needs to be a hospitable place for a pregnancy to grow, and we need fallopian tubes to be open. And so when we are, when if for me in the clinic, I, if when people are having a hard time getting pregnant, we're investigating these building blocks. You know, these are the things that we investigate in a fertility evaluation. And for some of our patients, it's about how am I going to obtain these, these components? I have eggs, but I need sperm. I have sperm, but I need eggs. We have egg and sperm, but we need to borrow a uterus. So again, all of that is the context with which we think about fertility care. These are our components. One of the sort of trigger points I mentioned was I'm, I'm not ready, but I'm feeling pressure. Okay. And, and I hear this all the time. It's interesting because when I talk to young women now or any women now, I'll say, oh, you know, well, how can I help you bring you here today? And people will be like, well, I'm here because I'm 32. Well, that's why I'm here. I'm here because I'm 35. Well, that's why I'm here. And so I think a lot of us have this general awareness of this really unfair process of ovarian aging and it creates pressure, right? And you feel that you can feel that magnified this time of year. What that pressure is, what that really is, is this, this problem that for females, all of us who are XX, we are born with all of our eggs. Okay. All of your eggs are in your ovary the day you're born for all of us. And over time, we lose eggs. It's just the normal process of ovarian aging. The number of eggs that we have goes down and the quality of those eggs decline. And it ultimately results in the aging of the ovaries and an increased risk for infertility as we get older. And, and, and I actually feel lucky to be providing care to a generation of women who do have an awareness of this. And then also have access to get the information and to do something about it as an aside. So again, this is just a, a graph here that sort of shows like what's happening to my eggs. You know, um, this gray line just shows, look, yes, the most eggs you ever had were when you, it was when you were born. And, you know, they, it goes down and down with time. And then this yellow one just says, hey, look, what are, when I, if I'm trying to get pregnant when I'm 20, my chance of getting pregnant every month is 19% per month. But if I'm trying to get pregnant at 35, it's between say 10 and 15% per month. And then you can see as we get into our forties, it's harder. And so, you know, this is the heart of the problem. And I think this is, you know, what creates this sort of general pressure feeling that we all, that many of us will have. Next slide. There we go. 35, I, you know, I have, I have mixed feelings about this and 
it is true. A lot of people think about this number as something like a, the magical moment in which, you know, fell off a cliff. I turned 35 and it's, it's all over for me. I'm done. And, and it's not really true. I mean, I think it is important. It is where statistically speaking, if you're just looking at numbers, you'll st start to see a little bit of a sharper decline. But I always say like, don't worry, your eggs don't know your birthday. It's a it's a moment to, to think. It's a, what I like about this is that we're creating a number where I say, okay, um, it's time to at least plan. I'm going to think about it. I'm, I'm 35 or I'm about to be 35. I'm going to get information. I'm going to get information about my body. I'm going to get information about my egg numbers. I'm going to learn about what my options are so that I can make an informed choice about what to do for myself. And I think that to me is one of the most helpful because I think any sort of anxiety created around it, maybe even like I said, we we're talking about extra this time of year, isn't so productive. It's just like a, hey, things are happening. And now it's time for me to plan. Just like I've got, you know, a 401k, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to plan. I'm going to plan. I'm going to plan for my retirement. I'm going to plan for the family I want to build in the future. And so I think that that to me is the most constructive way to think about this, this number. Um, what does it mean to be infertile? Again, this is sort of a a definition here. It, it's true. Fertility, you know, is a, is a, it's a disease. Right. So now not talking about preservation, but actually couples or individuals who are trying to get pregnant and having a hard time. We see a lot of that. And um, technically, we sort of define it as over, you know, having unprotected sex at the time of ovulation for over six months. And, um, you know, we act, ASRM actually just is starting to try to redefine this sort of to as well. But again, I think that six months is a goal, a good time sort of to think, hey, like at least again. It's not that you're not going to get pregnant. It's not that you're not going to have a baby. It's just time to say, all right, time to start thinking and planning and investigating and getting some information so I can make informed choices for myself. You know, and if, it's just like infertility is, you know, like diabetes, it is a disease and it's a fairly common disease, right? One out of six couples will experience infertility as females. I, if this is another really common thing I see. It's my, it's obviously my fault. It's obviously my fault. Like there's, I almost never see a female come in and it's like, it's definitely him. We're here and it's definitely him. I rarely see that. There's something we just like own the burden of it. Um, but it, the reality is, is that a lot of, it, it takes two. The eggs are just as important as the sperm, right? And we do very commonly see, you know, um, at least some contribution from, from the male. Um, and again, I think the other thing that I think about is when I think about infertility as a disease, it's not your fault. That's the other thing I see really commonly is that patients sort of feel like shameful. And I think we're going to talk about some of these feelings in just a minute, but like shame that I've, I've done something wrong. It's because I, I ate this or I did that or, you know, something that you've done wrong. And, and I would say, look, like if you had lupus, would you, you wouldn't say that, right? Like this isn't, this isn't your fault and it is hard and we will get through it, but you didn't, you didn't ask for it. And you don't deserve it. And that's something people like, well, maybe it's the universe telling me that I shouldn't have children. No, 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 it's, it's not. We just need to, you know, again, it, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, again, this is sort of a, an ode to some of our, uh, our more holistic approach, ideally to fertility care. Um, we've talked about age as a contributor, contributor to infertility, uh, but there are other things, right? And so both as things that you can use to optimize, right? So often in sort of like preconception care, we're talking about this or in the middle of fertility journey, what are the things, what kind of diet and lifestyle things can I do to optimize? It's not your fault. Again, it's not, you're not infertile because you ate the wrong thing. But we're always in the in the sort of we're always wanting to make everything as good as it can be, and that's where this stuff comes in. What is sort of the optimal diet? What are some good lifestyle choices we can make? Um, mental health. We must support your mental health. I, I, if it were up to me, and and I know it's not because everybody everybody who walks in my door would then walk into Tanya's door. It would be like you'd see me first and you'd see her second, right? Because that would be the most like it was like there's no. Of course, I'm not telling you there's something wrong with you because you need to see Dr. Wood. I'm telling you that everybody who is having to face this journey deserves that. Support yourself. It's it's something you deserve. It's not it's not because I'm I always I I see people think, "Oh, if I say, look, I'm going to send you a list of really trusted therapists." So like, she thinks I'm unstable. She thinks I can't do this. She thinks, "No, no, 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 no." Everybody deserves it. 
this is a really, fertility journeys are really, really hard. I have had, I tell this story a lot. I had a patient once early in my career and she was a breast cancer survivor and she came in and she had undergone chemo and now she was struggling to get pregnant. And she looked at me and she said, when I had breast cancer, this is so much harder than when I had breast cancer. Cause when I had breast cancer, everybody rallied behind me. They visited me in the hospital. They wore pink. They went on, they marched for me. And here I am trying to do the thing that's most meaningful to me other than staying alive. And nobody knows. And I'm suffering in silence and, and it feels like it's my fault. It feels taboo. And she identified it as just unequivocally harder than her breast cancer journey. And so I really do think, again, I, I love to be part of these mental health you know, events and webinars, because I really, really believe at my core that it is such an essential part of the fertility journey. So I'm honored to be here with Dr. Woods today. And I am excited. I think I'm about to be done with my boring stuff and we'll get onto the good stuff here. Um, next yeah. Time. I just wanted to also jump in. I, I know some people may have joined a little bit later. Um, your questions will absolutely get answered. We're just saving them for the end. So that I see everyone's questions are filing in. They're all amazing questions. We will absolutely save time at the end. We just want to get through the, the whole presentation and then we will get to your questions. Absolutely. So don't think we're ignoring you. Okay. Sorry. That's me. Now let's go ahead to Dr. Wood. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Brower, for that great introduction. And, um, and that's, it, that may seem like the boring part, but it's such essential critical information to have because with information comes power and knowledge. And so I, I don't think we can ever repeat some of that um, enough. Um, and, it, and it does, I think, set sets up the conversation of then why this is so hard, and especially why this time of year is so hard. I mean, first of all, you're with the people you love and people who love you. And and I know that some of the comments in the, and questions in the chat have already been about um, navigating these conversations with people who love us and that that love you and that you love, um, and and you know how to protect those relationships, maintain those relationships during these difficult times. So it is definitely hard. You're also just trying to have a good time. <laughs> it is a holiday. You're eating delicious food and maybe wanting to have that glass of wine that they've told you you shouldn't be drinking, and you're just trying to like you know celebrate the end of the year, being with family, et cetera, you have time off from work. Um, so it is you know, inherently a time where you're supposed to be relaxing and enjoying. Um, but uh, as we know, that doesn't come as easily during this time um, in part because we're gonna go to the next slide, which is gonna um, tell us. I, I think one thing it is, is, and I just said it, it's the end of the year. It is yet another marker of time or time that has passed or, or a loss that has occurred. You know, um, whether we want to or not, we have it in our head. This time next year, I will be, you know, 10 pounds lighter, have more money in the bank, et cetera. Um, and that includes our planning, our family planning too. And so coming this time of the year just reflects that time period that maybe that has passed and it's a marker of, of um, yet another year. And so the holidays really represent that. Um, and we're dealing with a different reality than expected. We, we thought that we, we've we probably planned, and, and, and let me also say this, I should have said this at the start, like I come into this space as a provider um, for Kind Body, but I also am here as a, as a patient. Like I myself had my own infertility journey as part of my family building. So when I say we, I am actually speaking to the collective, we, <laughs> my experiences with this too. Um, it's a different reality than expected. You know, it's like, you know, the things that you thought you would be buying, the holiday card you thought you would be sending, um, all, all of those things. And, and we're confronted with a different kind of reality and that can make it very difficult. Um, also just the idea of not being able to travel. Um, again, we talked on the previous slide about this is time to be with family. It's time to relax. And um, you maybe even had some travel plans or holiday plans in place, but now you're in the middle of a cycle or because of the cost, and you're, you're going to have to put those on hold or delay those for a while. And that can make it very difficult and stressful. Um, and, and you're stressed out. So, so maybe those questions from well-meaning family members and friends, um, you, you know, two or three months ago, you had a different kind of capacity for and bandwidth for, but, but now there's just a lower tolerance for some of the questions and just the family dynamics in general. And you're probably already anticipating the questions that you're gonna be asked. So there's the anxiety, this anticipatory anxiety of when are you gonna have kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and there also may be, you know, a, again, there's family members around who maybe themselves have recently either announced their pregnancies or given birth. So you may be around families with new babies and experiencing lots of understandable, relatable, normal emotions and reactions that sometimes we tell ourselves we shouldn't be. We should not be jealous. We should not be angry. Um, but we are. We are. And and I think uh, when we get to managing and coping with the holidays, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And you just want to be feeling it, you know, um, <laughs> having to pretend to be happy and festive when you're just not in the mood. And that and by the way, that could be because you are in the middle of a cycle and it's your stems and you're just like, oh, bloated and uncomfortable. And, um, and so you just may not be feeling it. And so kind of being in the space of trying to put on a happy um, face when you're not in the mood kind of um, adds again to, I think, all the other stressors and all the other sort of um, ideas of what for the impact fertility has already had um, on you and um, your family. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what can you do? Um, and again, I'm going to talk about these and I, and I don't want to suggest that they're kind of easier said than done because I think they are easier said than done. Um, but they're just some some glimmers of hope, some ideas, some things to kind of at least a couple takeaways to um, put in your back pocket to have in your toolkit to navigate the holidays. I think one thing that we can do is plan ahead. Um, already, many of the questions that have come through in the chat and the Q&A are about the anticipation of certain questions or that you're already dealing with or possible scenar scenarios and how to deal with them. And so I, I would say plan ahead, rehearse the strategies and the answers. And, you know, I, I'll go ahead and address these questions now since it's come up quite a bit. You know, it's, it is a, a sort of a fine line because I think our families are asking us questions because they do care about us. They love us. They don't want to see us hurting or in pain. They've got their own emotions as well. Um, but we're also just kind of needing, you know, to, to navigate this in a way with our support. And I say, it is okay at this point to be selfish. You have earned it. You deserve it. <laughs> you can be selfish and you can let people know what you need. And I think the best thing to do if, if questions come up, is just like, oh yeah, you know, right. I'm taking a break from, from heavy conversations today. I'm taking a break. You know, let's just talk about something else. So prepare like the diversions, prepare the other kinds of conversations. Um, or say like, you know, the things that, that I, that I do need your help with is this. You know, um, let them know what they can do to help you. You know, if you are from a family that um, prays and say like, you know, I thank you for letting me know about um, cousin Sally, third sister who, you know, stopped stressing about it and got pregnant. But actually what I need help with is <laughs> a cleaner every Thursday. So that's the best holiday gift you can give me. <laughs> so tell them what they can do for you. Cause I think people are also trying to figure out how to be helpful. Um, and, and it's okay to be selfish and say, you know, the questions aren't that helpful. Trust me, I'm already thinking about it. Trust me, I've researched all the medicines, all the techniques, all the possibilities. But what you can help me with is like, when when I, I need, a, a, you know, a break and I just want to go to, and I don't want to think about this, I want to go see a movie, be that person I can go see a movie with or take me to a movie. So plan ahead. I'll, I would also kind of communicate, again, what you need with people you trust and what your escape plan might be. You know, I mean, whether that's like a, a, a word that, that you agree to ahead of time, um, or it could be a text, like an emoji text that likes, like, if, if I send you this emoji, then I need you to come grab me from the conversation that I'm in. Um, plan ahead or build in something. Say like, you know what, I'm so happy to come over for this get together, but you know, I have another event in 30 minutes and so I'm going to have to take off. Plan ahead and plan ahead what your escape plan might be so that in the moment when the emotions are high, it can feel a little bit more like automatic and organic and you don't have to think about what am I gonna do to get out of here? You already know what that's going to be. And another way to think about this and the reason why things like preparing ahead and even an escape plan is important is this is your holiday and you can organize it and plan it your way. Take care of yourself first without caring or worrying about what other people think. And I know again, that can be difficult because there can be family expectations of behaviors um, but, you know, one of the things that I did for myself um, in taking this advice was I just left the country. And I know that not everybody has the resources or finances to do that. But I was like, you know, I think I'm actually just going to spend the last two weeks of December somewhere else. <laughs> and it was probably one of the best things that I did for myself because um, and, I, you know, I just the idea of confronting 
questions and everything just seemed a little bit more. And I, I've always wanted to travel. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. It was the first time I got a passport. It was the first time I traveled alone. And it was really important for me. So this is your holiday. You do it your way. It doesn't have to be an international trip. It could be a staycation at home, watching movies you know, on Netflix. But it is, it is up to you to decide how you want to spend your holiday and give yourself permission for that. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. I was going to say, kind of what I hear you saying that's in there, just like, so, you know, just to reiterate, you know, don't do things just because you have, feel like you have to do them. It's like the same idea of like, you don't have to go to the baby shower anymore. You don't, you just don't have to do that. Like if you, there is event or some sort of family, some sort of holiday gathering that is really giving you a lot of anxiety and maybe it's one or maybe it's all of them, just give yourself the permission to do something else. And it's not forever. You're not gonna skip every holiday for the rest of time or every this Christmas party for the rest of time, but give yourself the grace to say no this year. And, and then think about what it is like really at this time, at this really hard, vulnerable time, what do you need? Like giving ourselves the space and permission to say, you know, I do a lot of things that aren't for me. Most of us probably do most things that are not for us. But today, this week, next month, I'm going to do this for me. And maybe it's not going. So like just giving ourselves the space to do that. And then it sounds like once you're there, get it. Well, I think we talked about this last year, like even role playing. What are the five questions that I'm most anxious about hearing? I am anxious. I feel anxious because I know somebody's going to come up to me and tell me that if I just relaxed, obviously I'd be pregnant. Somebody is going to come up to me and say, so when you having, you know, your kid or what, what are the three questions? And then, like you said, like have the emotional reaction to them at home and even rehearse what you're going to say, like do some role playing. And you say like, when that, when that question comes, cause I know it's going to, here's, I'm going to practice answering what I'm going to say. And then kind of like maybe take some of the anxiety out of it. Is that. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. And, and I know that um, one person in the chat in the Q&A said that they actually had hoped that letting family members know what's going on would decrease the questions, but now it just has changed <laughs> what mm -hmm. the questions are and kind of observations of behaviors. So I think it can be, yeah, anticipating either the five top questions or the five kind of like comments, observations that people are going to make and role playing, rehearsing a, a reaction to that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so important. And and I think the idea of um of of thinking about what you want, because we do so much for others and, and thinking about it is, is that idea of cutting yourself some slack. It is it is okay to not be okay and honor where you are because you that's where you are right now today. It's not where you're always going to be. It, I know it might feel like that sometimes, like that you've been in this pattern and you're not getting out of it, but it won't always be like this. And it is where you are today. And it doesn't mean that. Um, you know, the next holiday will be the same or that you will feel the same or that you, this is always going to be how you manage the holidays or that you, will, as Dr. Brower said, you won't be going to the same holiday gathering um, next time. But for today, it is where you are. And um, and it is okay to, to be in those places um, with those emotions and, um, and kind of honor that for yourself. And, you know, in the way that I talk about this, um, is that the reason, oh, the other reason why this hurts is because it means so much, because it matters so much. It's something that's really, really important to you. And I think when we kind of lean into that, like, yes, this hurts because it means so much, we can then begin to kind of give recognition to the meaning of it and say like, okay, yeah, like it's, it's I'm, I'm okay being hurt because it's telling me what's important to me in my life. And, um, and sometimes we tell ourselves again, what we should not be, we should not be jealous. We should not be angry. We should be grateful. I mean, the whole, this whole time right now, right. Which is my next point, but <laughs> if, if you're not there, you're just not there right now. And that is, that is okay. Um, but one thing that you can do is, is give back. You know, if you are, um, if you have the, the emotional resources and the physical resources to maybe volunteer, somewhere um, and um, you know, participate in some sort of charitable giving during the holiday season, I think that can just also kind of get our, get us out of ourselves and, um, you know, and, and feel gratitude for what we can do and what isn't with our, our control right now and how we can contribute to something um, positive. And lastly, before um, we leave this slide, is I want, 
I call it finding joy. And again, I know that may seem like, how am I supposed to do that in this time? And it can be anything like, you know, this holiday season, again, it's part of the whole, like, do your holiday your way, giving yourself some slack, taking care of yourself. Like, what are the small things that you can do that, that just cultivate a little bit of joy? It could be a, a cozy pair of socks. You know, it, it could be um, downloading a new holiday uh, album, music album from one of your favorite artists. Um, you know, one, one story that I share, again, from my own experience when I was going through this was, I, I love holiday cards. I love making them. I love creating them. I love sending them out. And, um, and you know, and when I found myself single <laughs> and um, questioning all that and preparing for all the questions I was going to get, I was like, you know what? I'm going to send the most fun holiday card I can. So I, I'm in the uh, Los Angeles area. And years ago, this will tell you how long ago it was. I don't know if they still do this. At one of the local malls, they had a hunky, H-U-N-K-Y, hunky Santa. <laughs> As an alternative to the traditional Santa, you know? So it was usually very like built buff uh, gentleman in a more scantily clad Santa outfit. And I went and I took my picture and that was my holiday card. Um, now the downside to that though was my mother thought it was someone I was dating. <laughs> she was very happy. <laughs> and I had to clarify, no, it was a stranger. But it was like, I was like, you know what? I am going to lean into this. It was kind of a little snarky. Like you guys keep asking me for the picture. You got the picture. Here's your picture. But do the thing that brings you happiness and joy. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a Christmas card with, you know, a hunky Santa, but, but find those things for yourself. Okay, <laughs> next slide, please. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so some other sort of survival tips, and we've already kind of talked a little bit about this, but again, it's really important just to manage and reset your expectations. Again, that idea of like, it's supposed to be in the holiday season, we're supposed to enjoy, and that just may not be it. And manage and reset. And maybe you're, maybe it is like, I just want to get through this, um, you know, without, um, you know, feeling any more negative about myself. I just want to make it through without yelling at someone, you know, so manage and reset your expectations. And that um, I think can prepare you for, for entering into difficult um, family or friends or holiday dynamics. It's already been stated, Dr. Brower um, mentioned this, just rehearse your answers to those difficult, nosy and sensitive questions. It's amazing how intrusive um, and invasive <laughs> people feel like they can be around this topic and just rehearse your answers and, and even if it's not answering the question if it's a diversion if it's a joke if it's like oh so you know what i think i you know sorry i gotta, gotta run to the restroom really quickly whatever it is for you that feels authentic and sincere to you that you can feel like i can say that i can easily say this um rehearse that for yourself this might be a good time to take a break from social media if you haven't already you know, I think that, and, and, and the holiday cards, you know, again, I love holiday cards. I love receiving them, but it was a mixed blessing because it was like year to year, I would get all the cards with the family members and see, you know, all the cute cards, which is probably why I like them so much. I wanted to be creating my own, you know, with my family, but taking a social media break could be very helpful during this time as well. I think seeking the support, the kind of the right kind of support from a therapist or partner or friends, those who, um, who give you the kind of support that you feel like um, really does kind of fill you up and fill up your own resources. Um, so not those, I know sometimes our support systems can drain us too. So it's kind of important to know which ones we're leaning into at this time. And I think again, finding time for yourself and whatever that looks like, how that you know comes out, if it's a walk, um, if it's just you know binging Netflix, if it's coffee in a coffee shop, finding time for yourself um, is a is a really important strategy, setting boundaries and not feeling bad about it or guilty about it. Um, and and again, that could be part of the rehearsal too. You know, um, I'm just need you know not feeling good right now. I need a little bit of break, or I'm really excited about you know jumping into this new book that I just you know borrowed from a friend. Setting those boundaries and not feeling bad about it because that's a way of being easy on yourself. And again, doing your holiday your way. Um, without apologies to anyone and without offense to anyone. It's not about not wanting to be with you. It's not wanting to take care of myself. And that is really the way that you can practice self-care in a way that works for you. And I think trying to de deliver that message, um, that it's not about not wanting to be with family, <laughs> but it really is about prioritizing myself and putting myself first and just um, taking time to, to 
to do some reflection and healing um, as I prepare for the next cycle or the next year, et cetera. And community is key. So I mentioned surrounding yourself with support systems at work. Here at Kind Body, we have a lot of support systems that you can uh, reach out to. We have some free support groups um, for all patients, and, and I facilitate some of those groups. I, I think that we've, I, I, I hope we, hopefully I'm speaking correctly. I think we've actually added a group specifically for LGBTQ plus population that, Lin, that Dr. Lindsay Buckman uh, leads, but I also lead some groups on Tuesdays. And please join any of these groups. They are free at no cost. It is with the intention of creating community, creating support, um, especially I think right now. And you can find all these on, on Evite. And there's also our nutrition um, and other holistic services, as Dr. Brower mentioned. Um, I mean, I think one of the I think greatest benefits of Kind Body and one of the reasons I feel so privileged to be a part of the Kind Body family is the attention to the whole holistic person. And so um, please reach out for any of the other services that our Kind Body 360 offers to you. And if you awesome. need, you know, do you want me to say this or? I can, I can get that. Uh, oh, Dr. Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. And also just to reiterate, we will be sending an email follow up to all of you with all these information, the, you know, support groups, Kind Body 360, how to book a consult, all of those things, um, resources to you, as well as the recording to this webinar. So let's, I see there's some questions on that in the chat. So yes, absolutely. You'll have all these resources in an email tomorrow. So not to worry. Um, but again, you can book a consult at kindbody.com. You can find all this information at kindbody.com. And if you do have a, an employee benefit with your employer, um, you can just start get started by activating your account. And that will also be in the email. Um, all right, let's get into some questions. Oops. Okay, um, let's get into some questions. So I know we touched on this uh, a bunch during the presentation, but let's get into some specifics. Um, we actually got a couple of questions about mothers um relationships between moms and and daughters or sons it's it's very complex and so uh let's get into one question we had um this audience members mom and her are very close uh but she puts a lot of pressure on her she already has six grandchildren but's worried that she's going to miss out on motherhood she keeps asking how often they're trying saying not to wait too long um all of that stuff should be private, but it's it's a little difficult. How do you basically let's let's to boil it down? How do we politely tell people we love? We know that they're well meaning, but please back off. <laughs> Maybe Dr. Yeah. Brower, you can. I think it's a good question, and I think that a lot of I'm like this too. Like, give me the language. Like when I listen to like my podcast for this or for parenting, I'm like, okay, give me examples of the language I can use. Like, just write it down for me, and I'll say it. And I think that what sort of we're saying is that. Let's, so let's do some of that, Tanya. Maybe we can sort of talk about different different responses. And I think there's different approaches. And when Tanya said, what is your sort of being authentic to your response? What feels right to you? Because there's multiple approaches and there's no right or wrong. And I know that some one of the one of the strategies is just diversion. Right. So let's go through the, like a potential strategy. And I'm just repeating what is it is diversion, meaning like anytime it comes up, well, how are you going to divert? And are you going to divert? Are you do are, is humor one of your strategies? I think humor is a common one where you sort of like tell a joke to divert. Do you just divert by bringing up another topic or does it feel better to you to say something more sincere? Like, hey, mom, I know that you're well-meaning. I know that you care, that you just care about me, but it is really hard for me when you, when you, when you, when you tell that to me, it is really, these questions are really hard for me. They make me feel anxious or, you know, just a simple, like, this is the thing that you're doing. That's really hard for me. This is how it makes me feel. And I'm wondering if you could do this instead. So that's like, those are my, as someone who does a lot of therapy, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, this is, this is like, that would be, I think that there, to me, there'd be either one or two routes where you just say, Hey mom, like you, I, you know, I get it. You really, 
you're asking me a lot of these questions and I know you're just worried and you want me to have the family because that's something I want too, but it makes me feel kind of sad and anxious when you ask me those questions. Um, how about this? When I'm, when I'm ready to talk about it, can I like call you? Can we make a date? But right now, like, can, we, can you not bring it up unless I bring it up? But I promise I'll bring it up when I'm ready. Or I, or it could be snarky, to be honest, that that would probably be the more con of, of a constructive way. But knowing myself, I'd probably just like make some joke about something someone was wearing or some something about the food. Or I'd make some sort of joke, like whatever popped into my head for like a witty diversion joke. And I don't know if any is if either is right or wrong you're probably going to get further with that one and that like if your mom's respectful she doesn't bring it up again but those are kind of my initial thoughts how, how about you Tanya yeah no I I, I agree I, I, and I wonder I think um we get along so well because I would be snarky too. <laughs> that's, that's my go-to it may not always be the the most appropriate or most effective but it, it feels good in the moment Mm -hmm. um, but I do think the language about, yes, I, I, I know you're asking this because you really care. I will let you know when I am ready to tell you, I will let you know, um, when I want to talk, um, and then what, what you can do for me. I mean, I had those conversations with my mother who is very religious and very spiritual. And it was, I, I know you're asking because you care. Um, I'll let you know when I have something to talk about. What you can do for me in the meantime is pray for me. I, I, I you have a much more direct line to God than I do. So please, you, you pray, um, because I, I, I need your prayers, and and that was helpful, you know. And then, um, and she did give me the space to wait till till I came to her to tell her. Um, and I think I agree with the diversion of finding something else to talk about. But I think I, what I'm seeing in the chats are that people are saying that sometimes that that only works in the short term and not very mm -hmm. long term mm -hmm. um, for some family members. You know, another thing, I've, I've been actually writing down notes trying to think about it, you know, um, a, a way possibly to talk about it is say, you know, again, thank you all for the questions. I, I am, I'm creating my village for support. So when, so when we are blessed with a child, I want to know who's going to be around for support and the way you can support me now and show you're going to be part of my village is ABC, you know, um, you know, uh, take me out to the movies when I need it or bring me a cup of coffee. But right now what I need is um, I really want to hear about you. I, re I really oh, want to. I want that glass of wine, that one right over there. Can yes. you for me? That's how you can, su <laughs> can support me right by now by go mixing me a cocktail. You know, yeah. I'm sure that's what I would say. But, you know, I think that you're right. Like, I think there's as if the, if you're a pleasing personality, you're like, oh, but if I say this to this person, I'm going to hurt their feelings because they were just asking me and I'm responding with, I need some space. And I'm going to hurt their feelings by saying that. But I think that that's what we're saying, right? It's like, you're allowed to do that. We invite you. We encourage you. Even if there's like a moment where like, oh, oh, okay. Like this weird, awkward moment where you told me not to ask the question I'm asking. That's okay. That's okay. You know, I think that that's okay. And, I, and I'm just noticing this next question here, which is sort of related, like, how do I get in the right headspace to be supportive of these other people who are having babies? I don't think you have to, right? I think it's totally okay to say, I'm going to go to this party. There's going to be two pregnant ladies and two, two babies, and it is going to make me very sad. And so what, what's your strategy? Are you, you have permission to not go. You don't feel well. You want, you go get a movie or a massage and, instead, like, I think that that's one thing, but then when you get there, then are you going to wait to see how you feel to be around them? Or are you going to avoid them? You do not have, you, you don't, you won't, you're not, it's not going to make you happy. It like, I, I mean, maybe it does, but I think there's a really good chance that it doesn't, that it is just really hard. And, and so like to add this extra layer that you need to feel supportive is a little bit unfair to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I think the other thing I would add to that, because I think part of that question is like feeling like, again, that the family pressure, the expectation that we have to go. And I encourage us to get more creative of how can I show up as the daughter-in-law, the sister, the child, the sibling um, in these settings. It may not always have to be your physical presence. Can you send flowers? Can you bake a goods that you send over? You know, um, is, is that is there's another way for you to show up that can still honor where you are emotionally in this space, but you can still be demonstrating, I am a part of the family. I'm contributing in the way that I can. Um, but for now, I, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling well enough to kind of be here in person, but I'll be here in spirit with, you know, 
these these gifts that I'm sending it instead. I, I love that idea. You know, again, I want to be there. I just can't. So here's here's the flowers. Here's the food. You know that I love that idea. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm just reading these questions as they come in here. Alcohol over the holidays. This is a hard one, right? Like I think that um. I happen, you're going to, there's no right or wrong answer. I happen to be like kind of a moderate on all things in terms of like nutrition and alcohol and all those things is that, um, deprivation can do more harm than good. And so, um, you know, I think as a general rule, like you don't want to be drinking heavily, um, you know, but I think that if you have less than five drinks per week, no more than two at a time, that it's unlikely to have any real negative impact on your fertility. Um, now, some people don't care about a cocktail or a glass of wine. It doesn't make them, it doesn't bring them anything. And so that's fine too. But if it feels like really, really a lot of deprivation, it's a lot of work to not have that glass of wine at Thanksgiving dinner. I think you should have the glass of wine at Thanksgiving dinner. That's my, my personal of, of feeling on that. And there may be doctors who say, hey, like nothing, none at all. But I just think that moderation is better than deprivation. Yeah. It's hard enough already. Absolutely. I, I agree. And um, and I often say to clients, like if it's going to be more stressful to not drink the glass of wine, just have a glass of wine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also, um, I want to just make, cause there's a bunch of questions in the Q and A. I want to make sure we get to some of the, there's a lot that are very similar. So we'll just kind of get into specifics, but this has come up a couple of times. And I think it's really important. Um, those who have suffered miscarriages recently, um, going into the holidays, having expected to be pregnant, super triggering, super difficult. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I'll start. And again, I think part of it is just honoring the grief and acknowledging the grief and, and, and honestly, the trauma, I think of it, because a lot of this is reminding the, the dates and the dates that we had in our head. Um, and so I, I think it's important. Dr. Brower has already said it. Is that like, I think it's really important to not think that you should not be sad or to not navigate that. And, um, so one is honoring your feelings. And then I think the second part of the question is like, what do we say to people? Um, who are who are asking and, and that might may, it seems like that may be people who um maybe don't know or not aware or maybe they do know and they're still asking questions um you know it is it's such a delicate balance and i saw someone else ask they're like you want to tell people just to like mind your own business because it is it is your personal and private story to tell and to determine who and when and how to tell it um and so, so maybe a, a very direct, honest answer is just like, you know, um, yeah, it's actually been a difficult, hard process and I'm not wanting to talk about it. But what I would be happy to talk about is this, or what would be helpful for me to talk about is this. And, um, and, I, and I think, because, there, because I also want you to open yourself up for the resources and supports that might be there. You know, I, I think around this idea of miscarriages, especially, it is something that we continue to not talk about. And I, and I know when I was going through and having my miscarriages, like I felt like I was the only one. And then it was like, as I started telling people, it was like, oh, yeah, no, I had one too, or I had one too. So so part of it is like, there may be some access to support that you're not aware of. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you need to go through your story. Again, it's your story to tell in your own way and time and to who you want. Um, but I think you can you can honor that like, yeah, it's been difficult, not easy. Um, what would be ha- ha- what it would help me though is to talk about something else. So maybe kind of a combination of stating the emotion and diverting the conversation. I think that that you said something really important, like um, because we're talking a lot about not like leave me alone. I don't want to talk, and here's the language I'm going to use. Um, so I think that, but who are you going to talk to? Because it is super important to have some community to talk to. And I think that finding it can be really challenging because truly, truly, if you have experienced miscarriage or recurrent miscarriage or infertility, it's really the people who have also had those experiences that will understand best. I think it is really hard if you've not experienced those things to really get it in the same way. 
But then it's like, where do you find that space where it's not like, well, but my doctor said this and my doctor, like, because those spaces can be anxiety provoking too. Like some, you know, if you go to like Facebook, those, oh, but wait, my, and then there's like this comparison that can be anxiety provoking. Like, where do you find your super safe people, your community who understand and, and also just make you feel safe. But like, once you find them going back as much as possible, like, what have you set up a date? Like, who is that person for you? I'm going to need to talk to you. Can we set up a phone date? Can we a Thursday at five, Saturday at 11? Can we just, can we just have those times where I just know I'm going to call you or go, if it's somebody you live near, can we go for a walk? Like, I'm going to need, can we go for a walk this morning, this morning, this morning, like once you find those people and maybe, you know, better how to like really making sure that you have times carved out to be with those people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question that came in early on um, for those in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, this one is my wife and I are both cis women going through the fertility process. And how do you recommend responding to questions like which of us is related to the child? Um, why am I the one carrying it? Who is the dad? Um, you know, is it your responsibility to have to educate those people on what's appropriate? I don't know. <laughs> what would you recommend? This is right up to my valley. I am taking a deep breath as like, <laughs> as even I hear the question. Um, I, I think my first response is, well, we're, we're, we are, we're both related. It is that we're building our family. Um, and, um, I, I am taking a deep breath and pausing because I, I just feel like there's so much embedded in the layers to that, to those questions, which I know, um, our, um, a lot of our families receive, um, like who is the parent and it's like no I, I I am the parent we are planning our family um and I again one thing that I kind of always go back to is you know and, and thank you for thank you for the question because we're trying to build a village of who's going to be of support to us and our kids and so um so let me know if you want to be in that village it's good for me to know the people that will recognize and see our family as our family and that we're both parents um I, and, and I know that may not be directly answering it because it is hard to not answer that without anger. And someone else mentioned anger and I want to acknowledge anger as an emotion. And I think that's okay too, to say like, yeah, it actually, not only is it sad, I'm, I'm actually kind of a little angry. So, um, and this is where I get a little snarky. It's like, so you, you let me know which one of the me's you want to show up. Do you want the sad me or the angry me? Cause we're going towards the angry me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, and I wish I had a better answer for that, but I, I just go back to the, like, you know, we are related. This is our family. We're build we're building our family and, and we're also creating our village of who's going to be around to support us and, um, and, and let us know. Um, oh, and before, before I forget, Cindy, someone asked you about articles and there is a kind body blog about how family members and caregivers can be of support. I, I only really know because I think I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we will absolutely share that in the email. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And we're, we're coming close to the end here. Um, there are a couple of questions just around and for Dr. Brower, this actually would be great for you to answer, um, traveling during fertility treatment and how do you deal with that? And things need to be refrigerated and it's very difficult to wrap your mind around and, um, any recommendations on safety protocols, drinking, anything around, you know, safety yeah. around doing that when you're actively in treatment around the holidays yeah the traveling around traveling and treatment is hard it, it can be done certainly I mean you obviously want to check with your doctor because depending on where you are in your cycle that's going to determine you know whether or not they need to see you or is it a time where they don't need to see you so certainly always check with your whoever's managing your care about that once you get the green light to go, things that are to remember is that carry on your meds. Don't check them. Don't put them in any check bags because what happens if something happens to your check bag? So, you know, carry a little cooler, put a little, put some, put a few ice packs in there and just carry it on with you. Okay. Even, I know that that's challenging, but even in the, I had a patient recently travel and somebody froze her like fall stem or something right? Like that, like they handed it off to the hotel, the hotel put it in the freezer and then we're getting, you know, she's panicking because her fall stem has been frozen. So I think just like keep a little cooler where you are, keep little ice packs, you know, it's, it, it's hard. It's a pain, but you know, you could do it. Don't panic if the ice pack warms up, 
it's okay. Like, honestly, you know, know that it, as long as you're doing your best and they're relatively cold, you're, you're fine. You're totally fine. Um, in terms of like risks to flying there are, remember the main thing that happens in a stimulation is that your ovaries are big and your estrogen is high, right? So that usually doctors are giving you some activity restriction, but you know, maybe some compression stockings on the plane, right? If you're taking a long flight and you're going to be seated for five or six hours, some compression estrogen, right? Blood clot, you know, long flight, those two things. So I always like my pregnant patients always say, look, get some compression stockings. You'll be more comfortable anyway. Walk around a couple of times on the plane, move while you're traveling, keep your meds with you. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. And let's get to one more question. I know that there, there are actually a couple of very individual questions here on like unique medical cases. We're going to try to keep these a little bit more high level, but if you do have unique questions like that, I really urge you to book a consult with a fertility expert at Kind Body um, that you'll be able to get more into your individual case. And, you know, our, you know, Dr. Brower can't get into, she'll need to see, you know, a lot more detail in order to answer those questions. So um, I do urge you to book a consult when you have a unique medical question. Um, but let's close out with one more. Um, let me see one that's been asked a couple of times. Let's talk about um, how do we, I guess, deal with family members who, um, are very, uh, I'm trying to figure out the right way to, way to word this, um, unrelenting, you know, you sort of say, you know what, I'm not really talking about that today, or, or you make a joke or you divert and they're persistent happens a lot, right? They're like, come on, like, give me an answer. Come on. You know, you're, you're not getting any younger or whatever. Um, I feel like there's several ways to go. It's like either you can make a joke and say, back off. Truly, I'm not talking about it today. You can, again, try to change the subject or you can be very sincere. But a lot of people have trouble with the sincere. I think that probably is the most effective. But a lot of people have trouble because it makes the other person uncomfortable. You don't want to be awkward. You don't want to have this like weird thing happen at dinner. Um, and I think a lot of people, while maybe they'll say, oh, I'll take myself out of the situation. I just won't go. Many people don't really have that choice. They kind of have to go to their family dinner. They can't not go. So how would you recommend dealing with the discomfort of like the sincere response of being like, you know what? I'm really having a hard time with this right now. Could you please not ask me any more questions about it? That's a hard one, Tanya. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, it is because they are because people are unrelenting and and you know maybe a, a little like I don't know sort of psych one hundred one which is like you know I I I I don't know how many more ways to say I really don't want to talk about this but if if you really it sounds like you need to talk about this it's but I'm not the person to talk about it too so so maybe I can help you find a support group family members or I can help you find you know here's a website resolve here's Kind, kind body's got information about fa what family members can do to help um, and just kind of put it back on them because you, we are already navigating a lot medically, physically, financially, emotionally. And the last thing that you have space for is to navigate and manage someone else and hold someone else's emotions. And that's kind of what they're asking you to do. Like make me less anxious about this. And so like, put it, give it back to them and say like, you know, I, 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 I've already asked a couple of times. I just really don't want to talk about it. It's, literally sounds like you need to, but it just can't be with me right now. So I'm going to go talk to, to somebody else about it. Here's some support groups. There's a lot of places online. I'm sure there's a fake Facebook group you can find. Um, yeah. Yeah. I actually, there's someone actually in the audience has a great recommendation of recruiting another family member to like sort of yeah. play defense. <laughs> great yeah, recommendation. Exactly. Absolutely. That's a yeah. great one. Yeah. And, and if, if you have a partner, partners, I think also can be really, really helpful to create uh, often their relationship around this stuff is harder. And I think you mentioned sort of like having an escape. I think that like what a, a signal, a text, a, like a pulling on your ear, stay close to each other at the party and, mm -hmm. and let your partner know ahead of time. Mm -hmm. If you see this happening, this is what I want you to do. So I think that that is really important is relying on other people who can protect you. Yeah. 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 Great point. Thank you very much to whoever sent that in. Um, okay. Wonderful. So again, I have a few questions about how to book consults, how to get into support groups. Our support groups are absolutely free. You do not have to be a kind body patient to attend one. You can join us at any time. 
Um, we will send links to those in the follow-up email. We'll send links to book a consult, though you can just kindbody.com. It's right at the top, book an appointment, very easy to find. Um, and anything else, we'll send that blog, we'll send the recording. You'll have everything you need to get in through this holiday season unscathed. <laughs> And, and thank you so much all. And um, we really hope you enjoy your holidays and that this doesn't uh, become too challenging for you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Wood. And thank you, thank Dr. You, Dr. Brower. Wood. Thank you, Dr. Brower. Thank you, Sydney. So fun. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you all. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye.